Good evening. I now call to order the January 5th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present. And that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's budget committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through a Microsoft Teams live event. Links can be found on the BCPS website and on board docs. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion is applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Bean if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Bean, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Okay, Mr. Kuhn. Present. Ms. Causey. Present. Ms. Hen. Ms. Mack. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. All right, thank you. Ms. Bean, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Yep, Mr. Saris. Present. Mr. Tantliff. Mr. Tantliff. You're muted. Present. Mr. Corns. And uh, Dr. Boswell McComas has joined us as well. Present. Thank you. Um, all right, we're going to get right into it. Uh, new business item one. We have uh, CARES. Today we're going to review uh, CARES and ESSER grants. Uh, this is basically an update and a discussion um, about uh, those that, those grants and that funding. So Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Saris, please present what you have for us. Thank you. Sure. Uh, did you want to share your screen, George, or would you like me to? Um, yeah, I can do that. Uh, it's, uh, let's see here, it's somewhat difficult to see this uh, without uh, referring to a separate printout or, or another computer screen. But um, we have this single exhibit, which is a the summary of of all five of these major grants, federal grants, um, that is taken from our website. Uh, it was it's it's been posted in compliance with uh, MSDE's requirements, and uh, it was also a version of this was posted. Um, last year uh, in order to uh, as in support of a survey uh, a public survey that was taken by the uh, division of communications to gauge public uh, support and input for uh, for these projects so um, I can give a brief summary. Uh, the first two grants, the CRF tutoring and technology grants totaling about $25 million were uh, unusual and emergency type grants uh, that did not come through the US Department of Education, uh, but rather the Treasury 
and were required to be spent by December of 2020, which was roughly four or five months after we received the grants. And so uh, it was- Mr. Sayers, I'm, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is it possible for you to increase the size of your screen? Sure, let me try this. Let me try- There you go. Focusing and- Kind of read it now a little bit. On, on, let's see, maybe I can do better. That's so, fine, I can no, see that. No, that's good, George. Yeah, since I'm talking about just the first two right now, uh, that might help. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes, now we can see it, thank you. Great, so as I said, it involved a rather monumental effort to spend $25 million between July of 2020 and December 30th of 2020, um, but I think we were successful in a number of areas. Uh, in, in terms of tutoring, those uh, wages were paid, paid out in stipends to our existing BCPS teachers and paraeducators uh, to work directly with students, as well as um, some training to help orient them to the remote environment. And almost all of the instructional materials were um, the first uh, large acquisition of materials that were specifically designed or particularly adaptable to the online remote environment. And the technology portion of the grant uh, was essentially uh, the, uh, the completion of a one-to-one -one device initiative um, for the uh, not only the K to two grades, uh, but also to make sure that every student who was uh, who who were all now learning remotely had a Chromebook device. And the contracted services portion of this is the are the service fees that were uh, required for the hotspots. So we purchased hotspots, but we also have to pay a monthly fee for service, just like you do with a cell phone. Um, so if you'd like, I can pause here and take questions on, the, on these topics, or I can uh, move on uh, to the next item. All right, I'll, I'll take a I'll go around really quick. Okay. Um, Ms. Causey, do you have any questions specific to these two grants to start with? So in the fiscal year 2022 adopted budget book, there's an appendix F that starts on page 333. So my question um, would be, are these funds that were spent in fiscal year 2020 um, the same numbers. So that what, what was planned was um, earlier was executed as planned. Yeah, the paragraph two on that page, um, the two CRF grants are exactly what I'm what I've talked about here. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, Ms. Mack, I'm sorry, Ms. Causey, do you have any other? I'm going to move on if you don't. No, I don't have anything else at this time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mack, do you have any questions regarding this? Not in this section. Thank you. Mr. McMillian, do you have anything? No, thank you. Section? Okay, and um, I, I have a question, but um, 
did uh, Dr. McComas, uh, she, she's rejoined. I knew she had to jump off. I was just going to ask about, I mean, we spent $12 million on tutoring. Uh, do we, do we have any idea of the impact of that tutoring and that expense? I don't think the budget, I don't think you guys are going to be answering that question. Um, no, so if, and that's why Dr. Boswell McComas made herself available. Um, all right, well, let's move on. If she joins back in, I, okay. I'll, I'll ask my question later. Sorry. So uh, I'm going to go to ESSER 1. Says that, uh, let's see, we might, I'm going to have to see if I can, yeah, let me try something here. I can customize this and might okay. I think I've got all years and all columns for SR one. Um, okay, well Dr. McComas has rejoined, so okay. I'm going to re ask my question. So um, I'm so sorry. I had no, your screen. timing was perfect, right? At the moment when they were asking. And that. I, yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, I'm out. All right. So uh, the $12 million that we spent on um, on tutoring, did we get any measurable progress or results out of that that, that we can share with the public? So um, the way I'll explain to you how we captured the um, evidence, if you will, for that part of the grant. So every school could design their own type of tutoring based on the needs of their students. So one school could do tutoring that was um, focused on uh, reading, uh, helping students get to grade level. We could have, they could do it on math. They could do individualized tutoring, tutoring with students as well. So the schools had to develop their plan. Their plans were submitted to their school executive directors who reviewed them and approved the, the plan that was in place. Um, and then they had to collect um, student artifacts or evidence of um, where the student was at the beginning and where the student was at the end. And um, and so that's it's really that tailored. And so we don't have um, large sweeping data pieces that I could go to and say, here was our baseline. Here's what we did for all these students, simul you know, at the same pace at the same time. And here's at the end. It was truly tailored to the, the school needs and the student needs. So I, I thought it was important for you to understand sort of the, the, the true customized nature of what we did with that um, and how they documented the progress for individual students, um, depending upon how they organize their program. OK, and just as as I'm looking at this, I'm making assumptions and I just want to clarify this with with you all. So the wages are what we actually paid for the tutoring, right? So that's somebody's time. Yeah. So that's almost five million dollars. And then the instructional materials associated. Was that associated with tutoring or is that just instructional materials during the pandemic? It was associated, I've, and George certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but it was associated with materials so schools could buy materials to help support um, the tutoring, um, depending upon what their customized program was. Um, and I believe, George, that's also we uh, use that to bring on one of the, um, I can't think of the math. Yeah, let me. Was uh, it one of the online math programs that you I, added? I think so. I remember pandemic. talking to Miss Mac about it back at that time. It seems like a lifetime ago now um, after everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Miss Mac actually has a question. So Miss okay. Mac, if you'd like to share, go ahead. You're muted. Are we talking about the cost of first in math? Uh, yes, I believe so. I thought I want to verify that I, I, that's the right math program. And, but I don't recall, okay, I guess my question is for the wages, is this tutoring that took place after hours? So a teacher may have taught during the day and then got paid 
extra wages yes. after hours? Yes. Okay. And then for the instructional materials, other than the first in math, what specifically, I know you said it's tailored at a school level and I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, if I remember correctly, the entire Bridges program cost $6 million and it looks like this is $7 million. So what kind of materials outside what we already provided to schools would this represent? Um, yeah, I'm going to go back to the grant here to see where we listed uh, the specifics. That, thank you, George. All, <laughs> all of the products, um, and let's hope I've got the right document here. Um, I do recall as he's searching for that, I do recall because this is the, the very first tutoring grant. Is that that's correct? Right. right? right. That right. very first one that came out um, yeah. in summer of 2020. I do recall um, us also purchasing some special education uh, resources with that. Yeah, there were about five or six products here. Um, I remember us purchasing um, uh, literacy materials for students that we uh, distributed. Would it be possible, George, uh, to attach what you were showing, which is the detail for the grant to board docs so that we so it's available for for people to look at? Because that seems to have a significant amount of detail um, and it may go. Uh, may allow for for us to kind of dive in and come up with questions because yeah. I know we're kind of hitching. I mean, this is this is supposed to be an overview and we don't want to get, you know, too deep into it, but these I mean are all really good questions. Um, but we have. Um, we don't have access to what you were just sharing and that seems to have a level of detail that we. So, that, that may answer some of these questions. Yeah, so the products were RAS plus first in math, read 180, mm -hmm. and ascend math. Um, we also uh, purchased web cameras for teachers. Um, and and then the, the remainder uh, were stipends. But I will attach, uh, submit uh, a detailed spreadsheet of that. Are the, those grant documents themselves that list everything, can you attach that also? It yeah. Might make life easier for everyone. Yeah. All right. Mr. Kuhn, I have a follow up question to that. Go ahead, Ms. Mack. Um, if I recall correctly, in the curriculum committee meeting, we provided approval for at least RAS Plus and Read 180 as part of our normal, um, you know, things that we do within the committee. And then that went to um, buildings and contracts with the recommendation of the committee. But I don't recall at that time that we said we would be using any type of grant funds. Was that changed after the fact? I don't recall at that point either, but um, typically when we have contracts, we'll uh, specify on there um, if it's using operating and or grant funds. And I, I'll go back and check that. It was just a curiosity. Um, and again, the last two years have been a blur, so I, right. I wouldn't expect you to remember everything. It was just, I, I specifically remember these products because it was RAS Plus, RAS Kids, Read 180, and System 44 or 144 mm -hmm. right. that we talked about all at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll go back and check those contracts. I, I just, 
um, it's just a question I have, but thank you. You're yeah, welcome. Nothing was purchased that for which we did not have or request a valid contract. No, I know there was a contract because again, I specifically remember talking about it. Okay. Or talking about them, those okay. contracts. Okay, Great. thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's move into the ESSER, uh, ESSER 1, okay. if we can. Yeah, so the ESSER 1, uh, the biggest single component of ESSER 1 was to support the food and nutrition nutrition program uh, primarily for full employment because uh, for the entire period that uh, school was remote, uh, we were delivering meals uh, ready to eat sort of basic sandwich uh, and um, packaged products, but this only required a fraction, maybe 15% of our workforce. And so uh, these funds were used to keep paying the salaries uh, uh, of the 600 employees that we that work in that office and to keep them on staff because without knowing when school might open, uh, we didn't want to lose all these people and then open school and have nobody there to provide these services. So uh, when the when the pandemic first hit in February uh, of 2020, we had about $17 million in cash assets in the Food and Nutrition Fund and we burned through all of that. And the, the three years of payments that you see here, which total, I think, uh, just under like 13 and a half million, basically uh, replenished the food service fund for that cash, uh, those cash disbursements uh, that we made throughout the school closure. Um, the uh, equitable services for non-public schools, uh, ESSER 1 was, is different from 2 and 3 in the sense that we had uh, for our Title 1 and our special ed grants, there's always a carve out or a set aside for private schools and students that don't attend our schools and we administer those funds on their behalf. Um, and in this case, this was like our regular Title I grant where we had, uh, we took applications and we made purchases uh, on behalf of uh, 52 non-public private schools in the county. And uh, they used those funds very, very much like our schools did for technology and instructional materials to support their programs because most of them were also remote during this same period. Um, we have remote salaries, supplies, materials, and equipment. These are primarily, the salary portion of this is primarily uh, professional development stipends that were paid to teachers uh, to train them in and support them in remote instruction, which continued long after the tutoring grant expired in December of 2020, right through the end of that 2019-2020 uh, school year and um, required, in addition to cameras, headphones and Bluetooth devices, um, all of which the teachers needed uh, to conduct that hybrid learning. Um, you know, additional monitors uh, and those types of supports um, throughout that school year. Um, 
the CTE materials were designed primarily uh, to support remote instruction as well and uh, allow uh, students to complete um, certifications. And I think I might have some detail there. Um, uh, health, health services uh, were primarily consisted of um, contractors, uh, PPE, um, and nursing stipends, and uh, facilities uh, did uh, do some modifications to uh, install uh, plexiglass screens and, and create one-way pedestrian traffic to uh, within buildings to minimize uh, exposure among students and staff. Um, and so that uh, that total just uh, I think 23.7 million. And as I said, most of it was food and nutrition. And I'm happy to address any questions you have. OK, um, Mr. Kazi, do you have any questions regarding ESSER 1 at this point? You're on mute. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, I would just ask with um, us being in the fiscal year 2022, uh, those numbers are currently budgeted, but not all expended. Is that a fair statement? Um, let's see, I think that we have expended these. I don't know, Whit, do you recall when you pulled these numbers in from accounting if they were actuals? Um, you, Joe, this is um, uh, budgeted right here, but I think uh, the primary expenditures still outstanding or the non-pub, there's some expenditures um, and a few other things totaling about a million dollars. Okay. So it should be done by year end, but it may uh, just go into Q1 of next year. Uh, the grant expenditures have to be done by, I believe, September 30th of 22. So that would be the latest. Right. Any sort of stragglers would, would get expended. Right. OK, thank you. And um, recently the board approved the superintendent's recommendation for retention bonuses for all BCPS employees. Um, and that was presented to the board um, as an December item that was 7. not on the agenda. Um, but did any of the funds for those, for that retention bonus, which um, uh, the board believed was totally appropriate to pay for all of our staff, did any of that come from the ESSER funding. I know there was going to be a request put in and I was um, curious if that request was approved. Uh, the request has not been finalized, but it will be shortly and it will be a reallocation of ESSER 3 funds uh, for compensatory services. So you'll see that uh, when we move down uh, a few places here. OK, thank you. So the retention bonuses uh, were not coming from the operating budget for fiscal year 2022. Correct. OK, thank you. Ms. Mack, do you have any questions for ESSER 1? I do not. I have questions for ESSER 2 when we get there. OK, Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions for ESSER 1, sir? Yeah, I've, Mr. George, would you help me understand and uh, the column FY 2020 food nutrition services, four million and dollars is that was money for to pay the the cafeteria workers, the food preparers while we were shut down starting in March of 2020. Correct. Now, OK, so then then the FY 2021 to six million dollars was additional monies to pay those workers, correct? 
Right. OK, so what happens to the money that was already budgeted to pay those people? Well, here's here's where a fine distinction crops up. We have money budgeted, but that budget includes both revenues and expenses. And each year we take in about 12 or 13 million dollars in in fees for paid meals and we didn't get any of that because all the food was free so the food was free we did not earn 12 million dollars and we still had to support our staff with salaries and benefits yeah so okay. that missing revenue yeah is the big piece it's a it, and that's because foods is like a self-sufficient entity by itself hanging out there is that correct yes yeah it, okay. it really operates like a business so so when you when you miss a big chunk of your revenue um that's when we started to burn through our cash okay george you help me understand it thank you very much sure Thanks for that answer. Mr. Saris, I, I want to follow up um, because I do have questions along the same lines. You said that this money is replenishing the budget uh, that was uh, there and it and I I understand even though we weren't selling food, we still there's still a level of food that we're providing for children in need. And since basically I know things were kind of moving fast and changing, right? And we went CEP across most of the system where everybody got free food. Um, so there was some level of funding and support for that, right. correct? So we get reimbursed from the Department of Agriculture and uh, through a commodities program as well as from the state and so those um they're whether they're grants or subsidies however we we term them in the financial statements i have to check but we still got those funds and those funds did pay mostly for the the products the actual materials and supplies that you know that make up the food the inventory and so it was the the generated revenue from services that we lost but we still got the state and federal support okay so so there was some level of support um but this just plugged a massive hole uh, to actually pay for the folks that we have employed you said around 600 people so um yeah. OK, and that right, really thanks. was a stated goal of the program to maintain and retain staff. And so we felt uh, a number of school systems laid their folks off. Frederick County did so. Um, just as one example that I know of. So this was important, I think, for the community. To, to retain these these people because it's difficult to hire food service employees. I mean, uh, we compete with restaurants and fast food establishments, and we have lots of of nice folks who are willing to work six hours a day for not a lot of money. And so it was a real, uh, I think, a success that we were able to do this. Um, Ms. Causey, you had a follow-up question. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, it, it is uh, very important for us to be able to retain our very valuable staff in every area of the school system. Um, also, I, I saw some of those uh, food distributions that were going on during the pandemic, and it was um, really a service that was necessary for our children, and it was something that was more convenient and really logistically possible because of the school proximities, uh, you know, just where people live and work uh, and already travel. So I really appreciate all the work that was done. Um, I would 
just like to ask George about this year, we are in somewhat of the same situation given the uh, federal grant that is allowing um, uh, no charge for any student in every school. Um, so is right. that correct? We're in, in a similar situation this year with not having the revenue we might typically have. Right, so I think what <laughs> what we're what we're going to end up with is um, no cash on hand, basically, which is something we've always had. Um, we've always been able to stabilize our meal prices uh, to re re purchase equipment, uh, replace equipment. Um, you know, without going to the general fund. And um, so we will just, you know, we replenished a good part of those assets and we'll, we'll have run them down again. And so the fund just won't be as flexible. And um, one of the provisions that we have in the next chart for ESSER 2 is the cost of the CEP program because um, by by eliminating those fees that we talked about, um, we'll start to run the fund at a deficit once we resume normal operations. And so we added money here for that annual cost of CEP and you probably remember in past years we've even asked the county to help us with uh, with those costs of about 2.6 million a year. So, um, whenever Since we're there, can can we start talking about S or two, please? Sure. Just roll on down and. Absolutely. Thank you. You can see the CEP right there for 2.6, right for this yeah. this year and next year. Right, I can only get part of this in here, but we'll slide over. Um, so yeah, let's just, that's the number I was mentioning, and that's for the 87 schools that we've identified. So that in a in a normal year, which which when we develop this grant application and and the budget associated with it, we all assumed this would be a normal year. Uh, and that we'd be, uh, you know, earning some revenue in the food service fund. Um, and so we put this amount in. Uh, this is not going to be a normal year. So we're probably, when we do the amendments, uh, we will probably not, we'll be able to redirect uh, these funds uh, to another item, which is probably going to be the extended instructional day. Um, so let me jump back up to the first item. <clears throat> we also anticipated our enrollment would bounce back and that we'd need teachers just based on our standard staffing ratios. So we, we allocated these funds um, and those that enrollment did not materialize. So uh, something that did materialize is there was a uh, a TABCO mediation settlement which changed the mathematical calculation for the value of the 15 minute day. And so um, that goes up by about $2.6 million a year. And so when we submit the amendment, um, that will uh, help pay for uh, those additional costs that were unanticipated. Um, and the other uh, amendment that we will uh, provide for is uh, six million dollars in uh, HVAC improvements. Let me slide over here to the right because I don't think. Yeah, don't think that's over there either, right? So so that is the plan for the uh, 
the ESSER II amendment. The other uh, program that you see here, um, there are two other programs. The next two programs that Dr. Boswell McComas uh, manages um, is the Accelerated Achievement and the Summer Programs. And, and those were planned originally for the ESSER funds. And then along came the state tutoring and the state summer supplemental grants. And in order to um, uh, really use those funds, uh, we decided to uh, take these two programs uh, and it's they're only eligible for grades four to 12. So the K to three programs will stay on the ESSER grant and, a, and the four to 12 programs will move over to the state tutoring grants. So these are the types of amendments that we'll be putting together this month. Ms. Mack, I believe you had a question regarding this or two. Yes, and I apologize because you may have said this, Mr. Saris, but enrollment recovery, be more, can you be more specific about enrollment recovery? Yeah, we thought we would have 115. Oh, I'm sorry. 000. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, so we came up 4,000 students short, and we're essentially where we were last year. Um, and so we really can't, I mean, we can justify the need for more teachers on other, for other purposes, and, and there is that in ESSER 3, but um, that enrollment just didn't materialize, unfortunately. Right, and as you know, when I met with you and Dr. Williams, um, I strongly encouraged us to fund all open teacher positions, even if we haven't had them filled because of lower enrollment or because we can't find candidates. So um, I am hoping that we expend these funds to lower class sizes, even if our enrollment stays down. And then my other question is about CEP. I do not profess to be a CEP expert, but I remember speaking with Dr. Hager saying that um, there was a new federal program that was just going to provide food. And I, I thought that that was implemented. So would that render CEP expenditures um, not necessary? Um, I guess I don't know. I can add something, George. That, oh, go ahead, Whit, yeah. Yeah, so for this year, uh, that program is in effect for this school year, and it's nationwide. All the children are getting free food, so CEP would not need to be in effect this year because it's overridden by the USDA National Free Food Program. Now, uh, as far I've not heard anything about it being extended for next year, um, but I'll have to check with Food Service if they've heard anything. Um, so if it didn't, then we would be back to our 87 CEP schools in uh, FY23. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Sure. And I guess this is my own opinion, um, but I have difficulty seeing us returning back to the pre-COVID era. We've been feeding students for free now for two years, and I just don't know that the public and the country at large are going to be able to move back to that fee-based model. And so it may be that in time, whatever normal becomes, 
um, that we won't have a, a fully self-sufficient food program um, and it may you know the 2.6 million cost for CEP um, may increase and and this may become rather than an, a free standing enterprise fund it may become like a special revenue program that gets support from the general fund and other sources because uh, we've kind of changed the marketplace for the school lunch program and that's just speculation on my part but as a financial manager I, I'm always thinking about how to sustain that enterprise fund status and it may it may be something we have to adapt to in the future. OK, thank you. Let me just slide over here to see if there's anything else again that. Yeah, I think these are just a continuation of um, the programs into 2023, which is when the ESSER uh, two grant expires September 30 of 2023. Um, and, you know, I, I guess it's obvious, but I'll say it that, that the, the extended instructional day is the largest piece of, of the grant, really of both grants. Um, and it's going to be a heavy lift for county government to sustain this uh, after the 23-24 school year. And uh, I know they're aware of it, we're aware of it. Um, and that's just, I know Mr. Kuhn has concerns about the cliff and this is the biggest single part of the cliff, so. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask, Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions? I no, no, thank you. Okay, and and then Ms. Mack, you said you had a comment. And well, I, I have a comment about what Mr. Saris just said. Um, I think there are more than one thing on this list that could be facing a cliff, but I agree with you that that's the biggest one. But I believe I'm correct in saying we wouldn't go back. We wouldn't cut the day by 15 minutes. So am I correct in saying we're going to have to find the money? I think so, because I know that having long had the shortest school day in the state, that um, the input I've gotten from George Duke is that having approved this school day the state is is unlikely to let us go back right to a shorter day so i do think it's it's going to be our our reality going forward okay I, and i just wanted to clarify that because i don't think it's to me it's not a discretionary type uh expenditure it's non-discretionary so we have to find it's like paying your mortgage you might not be able to go out to eat three times a week, but you you need to pay your mortgage. And I would see this as paying our mortgage. Uh, Mr. Sarris, this doesn't become, and none of this grant money becomes MOE, correct? Correct. So I mean, this is a significant amount of money. Every this is year. what we spend every year on steps and colas. So, um, and given that we've also, <clears throat> Are going to have that in addition it's 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 going to aggregate okay mr um, Kuhn, can i ask a follow-up question to that i'm sorry go Ms. ahead mr saris is there anything in kerwin that is going to help with the 15 minutes ideally yes and i think uh, we are all thanking and hoping on that um, and I know that in developing 
the proposed budget, uh, Mr. Tantliff discovered that the original Kerwin formulas were all based on full enrollment. And, and really that hasn't materialized. Um, and so many jurisdictions that had hoped to get a big influx of state funding will not see that this year. And, and we are working with MSDE, who's not yet been able to give us definitive guidance on, on where we'll end up and, and what we'll actually get from Kerwin. And from that, for that matter, we're not even sure what the new definition of maintenance of effort is from the county. This year, the county funded at, I think, 3.3 or 3.5 percent over. We're not sure that that even that level carries over to 23. So we've got we've got that question mark, which is part of Kerwin because Kerwin redefined MOE, and then we've got the 30 million dollars in hold harmless for enrollment loss that we got from the state last year, and we don't know if we're going to get that. So. The answer is hopefully, but we're not sure and we won't really know for another few weeks yet until the governor releases his budget on or around January 20th. And Mr. Tantlev, you may want to add something to those comments because you've been heavily involved. Yeah, I would um, just say as uh, a first for for next year, kind of reiterating what uh, George said, because the formulas start really getting enhanced um, in FY23, um, we're seeing what we would think of as an probably an average increase in state revenue, but it's it's because it's being offset by the loss of the hold harmless uh, that Mr. Saris mentioned and all our students that are missing. So in other words, the formula just ended up keeping us whole, if you want to uh, think of it that way. Now, the formula continues to escalate over the next decade, but there's there's a number of mandates uh, within the legislation that need to be paid for. And, and truthfully, the models, like any model, after a couple of years, they really become a little shaky because you have assumptions based on assumptions based on assumptions. So if you look at, go and look at any of the um, blueprint legislation, all of it still has the pre-pandemic enrollment trends in there. Uh, so where they've assumed local jurisdictions will not need, for Baltimore County, for instance, isn't really supposed to need to contribute anything more than they would have till 2028, it, it may turn out uh, to be different. Uh, teacher salaries need to be a brand new teacher right out of college in the beginning of FY27, so that would be July 1st, 26, need to be making a minimum of $60,000. So, uh, and of course, remember, if they're making 60, those same increases permeate throughout uh, the entire schedule. So uh, there's lots of significant costs in there. Uh, there's lots of potentially increased revenue. So. You know, I guess in a nutshell, it's certainly possible in a few years that we might be able to cover the 15 minutes as well as the other obligations. Uh, but in the end, if you spend 30 or 35 million dollars to cover the 15 million, no matter where the resource comes from, it may just crowd out something else for a couple of years. Thank you. Um, Ms. Causey, you said you had a question. Thank you. Um, just one last comment about the 15 minutes a day. So in the blueprint for Maryland, which is a statewide law uh, and implementation, the 15 minutes that the uh, superintendent and the board added to the day brings Baltimore County Public Schools on par with the other districts. So when the blueprint is specifying a starting salary for teachers, other districts and Baltimore County Public Schools those teachers will be teaching the same amount of time each day. Um, so it's not that we are having our teachers teach any longer than any other school district. It's that the teachers and the students now have 
the same uh, instructional time that the other school districts have already had. Um, I did have a question on the ESSER two funding, uh, the line one teachers for enrollment recovery, um, and the FTE is 122.3 with uh, $6.9 million. Um, if we're not able to staff to expend that funding, mm -hmm. so that's the question, are we able to staff uh, up to um, expend that money? And if we're not, then how else could it be applied? Right, so at this point, as we've talked about in board meetings with 800 vacancies system wide, we're not going to be fully staffed. Um, and I think that what we're going to do is um, cover the additional cost of the TABCO mediation for the 15 minutes. Uh, add HVAC improvements and um, reduce somewhat those accelerated achievement and summer programs, um, which, which could give us some flexibility, but I want to, we're sitting down this week to crunch these numbers and see if we come out more or less even or not. But the HVAC um, and the TABCO settlement would be the two big offsets it, it, without those FTEs in there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Saris, just to really clarify something, the fringe benefit line, is that associated in any way with the extended instructional day? Absolutely. That's the bulk of it. <laughs> it's a big yeah. number. Yeah, it's huge. I, I don't. What? Why is it split out? Well, that's just the way we budget. Okay, um, that's fine. I, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, and I because they literally should follow each other so that people understand that oh, you know yeah. people are getting paid this much, and you know this percentage of this <laughs> equals fringe benefits. It's just you know by breaking it out, you kind of have to. I figured the cost was somewhere, but. I, I yeah. appreciate that. Um, if we could move on because we're sure. running on time, okay. um, let's go down to ESSER 3. Okay, and I never thought we'd get something bigger than ESSER 2, but lo and behold, we did. Um, and let's see here. So let me. Uh, so let's start with the $31 million. Yes. And and that's in two. That's another year of that. If you go over to twenty three, so that's a huge number. And we're fortunate to have Dr. Boswell McComas here. But what we did was we estimated um, that out of our fourteen thousand students, I think with IEPs, it might have gone down a little because of enrollment changes. That um, that perhaps 10% of those students who were eligible who had missed out on services during this period of school closure that that were not able to be provided virtually um, because a lot of these are in person services, especially related services like OT, PT, SLP, occupational therapy, speech language, um, uh, physical therapy. Um, and so we made an estimate at the time uh, without really um, having not yet gone through all of our cases, which we have since done, um, to see if, if, you know, a percentage of families who were willing and able to access these services uh, took advantage of this opportunity, what it would cost, um, and we came up with a figure, um, and this all has to be provided outside of the regular school day to special education students. And um, so far, uh, we have not been spending at this projected rate, 
and we probably won't know until August how much of this we are really going to spend. Um, and since Mrs. Causey raised this earlier, because we're sort of lagging at present in terms of our uh, expenditure rate, this would be, uh, this is where Dr. Williams <coughs> felt we could reallocate funds for that retention bonus. But if it comes out later in, you know, over the summer that lo and behold, we really are going to spend all this, we would probably then have to go to our backup plan, which would be to reduce the HVAC allocations that are also in this ESSER 3 plan. So is this a good, and part of another special ed item here are the IEP chairs. This is something that we've wanted for the entire time I've been here. We currently have special ed teachers and assistant principals doing this job, and it's not ideal. And uh, we certainly would have had a much easier time allocating our compensatory services if we'd had these positions all filled all along because they're really case managers and resource managers for the Department of Special Ed. Uh, we requested them in our general fund budget, never been able to do it. So this is the big step forward for us because of the grant, um, which goes hand in hand with those compensatory services and making sure that we're following the plan and accessing the resources. So I can pause here if you have any questions for Dr. Boswell McComas. Ms. Ms. Mack, you have a question? I do. Um, this is very timely because I have been speaking with people today about this very issue and Many, many parents have told me that their children are not getting their compensatory services. Um, and that the reason that the answers that they've been given is that, and, and I'm sure there's some validity to some of this, is that they can't find providers. But one of the people said, you know, there are outside agencies that we should be using to provide students with the services to which they're legally entitled. So it concerns me that we have $31 million sitting here and I have 37 people saying to me that their child has not gotten the services to which the children are entitled. Am I am I misunderstanding what you're saying? Well, we are allowed and we have planned for using contracted providers in addition to our own staff, um, but I don't specifically know of the cases you're talking about where people aren't getting the services that they've requested, so I don't know if... Well, I mean, I probably would have reached out to Dr. McComas, but this all just happened today, but I, I just find it a little bit alarming that parent after parent has had the same... Um, experience and it looks like we have 32 million dollars sitting there that could help us provide the services to which these students are entitled right so i'll just um first of all thanks miss mack you can certainly um you know contact me and i'll we'll work with dr pierandozzi on those particular cases i think you you really brought um up a, a good point right around even um contracted service companies are struggling with staffing right now and that's not to you know we're all well aware of the staffing shortages in just about every field um, and so that is a challenge right now for us so I don't know again the particulars of the the individual cases that you're specifically referencing but certainly getting a compensatory services um, fully delivered is, is going to take us time because it's it's a matter of really contracting rather that's with their own teachers to provide the compensatory services after the school day or contracting with an agency that has staff to provide it it's it's really a matter of, of time of working through it but i absolutely would like to be able to um, dive into those particular cases so that we can try to 
find some resolution. Okay, thank you. And I, I apologize. It's been a really busy day. Yeah, no, no well, worry. Understood. <laughs> and this is like flooding the market with construction money. It drives <laughs> up the cost of building a school, but we're experiencing, you know, every school system in the country has gotten these funds and, you know, they're a finite amount of special educators and related service providers that we're going after. So it's it's difficult or it's been difficult. And just just to 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 make a point and understand here, who actually controls these funds? Is it down to the principal to say these children need these services, release these funds and go spend it? Or is it all the way up in the central office, you know, kind of showering money here and there? <laughs> no, I don't shower money, but um, what <laughs> Yeah, I like the idea though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what I what happens is compensatory services is part of the the a process of the IEP team process, right? So the the team has to determine to what degree uh, there is a a need for compensatory services, um, and then once that's established, we work with the um, the special education department to get those services scheduled again. So it, I'm going to boil this down to sort of like a very concrete example. Let's say Mary um, McComas needs compensatory services in uh, reading. And so really what that boils down to is I will end up getting tutoring services. Those tutoring services have to occur after school hours. We have to identify who is going to do that tutoring. It may be um, one of our own educators that again we're contracting with to, to provide the compensatory service or it may be an agency uh, depending upon what the specific need is and all those things have to be scheduled and um, and then we have the whole pay process. Now that's where George would be my counterpart to talk about the mechanics of that but just to give you an idea of sort of what's involved with that and those that can go on it may be that a a student is uh, walk uh, has compensatory services that equates to I don't know 20 20 tutoring sessions an hour long each session and they may be scheduled out over several months time. So George, I don't know if you can talk about sort of the mechanics of how that. That's will. that's fine. Yeah. I don't want to belabor okay. the point. Well, it's yeah, just, I, I, it's I mean, just I, a lot of money. Dr. And, I'll reach out to you. Yeah. I okay, want to make great. sure it starts to get out there um, yep. and understand the mechanism. It's, it's a tremendous amount of money to be pushing through the system um, and I'm sure we do some of it now. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware of this slug of cash in essence that you have sitting there. Uh, so anyway, I know that um, Ms. Clausey has a, has a follow up, uh, so please. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation because um, we do have students throughout the system that really do need um, additional services in order uh, to recover um, from the pandemic and um, the the services that they needed and were entitled to and were not able to receive. Um, our Special Education Citizens Advisory Council has regular meetings and one of their recent ones they did discuss this very issue um, at, around not receiving sufficient services. Um, and one of piece of that conversation was that some of the IEP recommendations were being based on the availability of transportation rather than saying, what is the need of the child? And then saying, okay, now we have to go out and get transportation. Um, I know that there are um, were programs in the past related to uh, paying parents uh, or a related person to take students if there was not transportation available. Um, so my question is, is what how can we as a system um, as a board, what can we do to make sure that transportation is not a barrier to these services? Because if the students could get to these services, they could take advantage of them. So um, that's a that's a question. And I just appreciate the work that everyone's doing to try and take care of these students. Thank you, um, Ms. Kazi. I and uh, George, I don't want to cut you off in case. No, I, go ahead. But I will, and, and thank you, Ms. Kazi. I appreciate that because you're right. There's a lot of logistics that go into making all of this work well and um, seamlessly for our students and transportation. 
Um, just with compensatory services is a challenge just as it is in our normal functioning um, situations. So we I do understand that the transportation office has been exploring some um, new ways of considering how to help support transportation needs because our needs are diverse, right? Not just for our school day, but for our athletic program, for field trips, for compensatory services, for our evening uh, students that attend our extended day learning program as well. And, um, and so I do understand that our transportation team is exploring some um, innovative ways that I think some of the other school districts are considering um, now. I don't really have all the details, but I do know I was talking to them about um, our evening school transportation needs um, as well. And they were just sharing with me that they were looking at things like um, Uber and Lyft uh, as they know some other districts are, are doing that. I don't know that our transportation team has gotten to that point, but I know they were doing the research and exploring how else can they add to our, our portfolio to provide um, enhanced service. All right, thanks. We're gonna have to keep moving here. Um, because we've got a number of items that uh, uh, Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Sarah still need to speak to uh, for ESSER 3, and then we'll come back with some more comments and questions. Thank you. Uh, and to answer your question, Mr. Kuhn, the type of, that's not a typo, uh, whereas ESSER 2 grant ends in uh, September 23, ESSER 3 goes all the way to September 24, and um, that uh, 35 uh, million is, let's see, whoa. That's for 131 pairs. Those are some highly paid pairs. That's why I asked uh, if that was a typo. That might be. Um, the total is right. In other words, the, the, the three years. The 50 million. 87, 77, and 52 are correct uh, in total. Did you uh, mean to have 31 million up at the top for compensatory special education services for 2024? Because that would make a lot more sense. Uh, we, I'm only aware that we had it budgeted for this year for 22 and 23. So, um, Mr. Tantliff and I are going to have to look at this to see if there is or what the mistake is. But my guess is that that's the third year of the extended day. So um, we have the first two years of extended day, the 15 minutes in the ESSER 2 grant. And I think that this is the third year um, of that 15 minute instructional day, but it looks like there's a line, a detail missing here for that particular item. It also looks like you would be missing the fringe benefits for that line item. Uh, you're right, it does. So why don't you do this? Why don't you guys yeah. Provide us an answer to kind of amend this doc or, you know, yeah. amend and update the document and, okay. and, and share an email with us about it. Um, yeah. uh, an explanation uh, of some yeah. sort. That would be great. Uh, the next six lines are for the virtual three, four, five, virtual academy. Um, oh, and actually, it does say. Uh, extended instructional day plus the 30, the 131 pairs. So I think that's. Oh, more, that's and, it, George. Yeah, that's where we were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we will double check the benefits. Um, hey, could you just break that line out? There's no. That's sure. very confusing just to. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I I'm looking at the formula. I don't know how you do that. Yeah, it had the formula had. Uh, just over four million for the um, pairs, and the rest of it uh, about thirty-one plus million. Just a, about the same amount is for the fifteen minutes. All right. Um, so the virtual academy is uh, 
over enrolled, understaffed, but plugging away. And uh, at one point, um, I had not knowing where we were going to put people. I had put in a million dollars for rental space, but I think we've moved people around in the Jefferson building and uh, done some remote uh, remote work approvals that will uh, allow us not to have to spend those dollars. Um, the 131 and a half pair of educators were designed to provide some additional support to the teachers who are now working 15 more minutes a day and and needed that support, uh, probably have needed it for a while. Um, the next line, the counselors, social workers, nurses, and health assistants are detailed down there on the bottom line of the table. And, and that is essentially what the board uh, added to the budget last spring that was not uh, funded by county government, but which uh, Mr. Olszewski also supported. And so uh, we, we added that with the grant. Um, we have uh, additional support services in the form of PPE, contract tracing and nursing stipends. Um, which are on the next three lines uh, and uh, the school based learning uh, initiative tutoring stipends. That's the accelerated achievement and summer programs. Um, some of which can be shifted to that state tutoring grant. Um, the HVAC programs uh, are another six million dollars um in addition to what we want to carve out of ESSER 2 um and let's see uh and then that big fringe benefit number and something else you'll see in ESSER 2 and 3 uh the next to the last line are indirect administrative <coughs> costs and those are uh permitted um under the grant uh, as the costs of general administration, such as uh, payroll, uh, human resources to hire and, and pay an additional 500 FTEs. Um, and uh, also this will help pay for uh, some of, you know, the, uh, the new payroll timekeeping system that we're putting in, uh, professional, the professional development system, the teacher evaluation system, all of these general administrative costs, um, uh, even hiring additional staff to do all of those things um, that are flowing from this uh, explosion of services that we're providing. OK, thank you. Um, this is a tremendous amount of information to kind of chew on. I do need to follow up on um, the virtual academy. Uh, you have it dropping uh, by nearly 100 uh, FTE in FY 2023. Is that because you expect it to taper off in 23? Well, I would say up until about six weeks ago, we had <laughs> and I think what Dr. Boswell and McComas is experiencing is something much different and it may be unknown yet as to how the program will unfold relative to the pandemic and the very high level of interest from families. So OK, Mary and then just me. and I, I, yeah. I just want to follow through sure. because it, it, it seems to me that I mean, right? These grants are limited time and they create cliffs because we've hired. If you look at the total FTEs that we're supporting with ESSER 3, right, that's 530 people. Um, and then it drops in 24 to 167 um, and change. So that's, in essence, another cliff. Um, 
because their salaries and fringe benefits will disappear because these grants, uh, we don't have an ESSER four or five or whatever. Um, so in essence, it's another giant question mark. Um, how are we looking at that uh, as you guys go through the, the budget process now? So Dr. Williams is coming from the same place and uh, some of the some of these things uh, will be in his proposed general fund budget so that we can try to um, over a period of three years that we have left here uh, try and build this into the baseline budget um, uh, and I guess some you know the for instance the virtual academy may may well go away, but it's going to be difficult for the IEP chairs and the additional teacher, the 78 teachers at secondary level to reduce classroom size. I mean, that's something we've been trying to recover since 2012 uh, when we took 193 teachers out of the, the ratios. So. Um, I think you and the superintendent are of one mind here and uh, we'll be talking about it next week, I guess. And, and just to, to hit on it, we have uh, $790,000 uh, for PPE supplies here. Um, you know, this is all flowing from the fact that COVID and the pandemic has hit us. And I'm curious, um, health service spending seems to be low uh, out of $362 million. Um, and I watched as um, the county executive today said that he was sharing and providing testing to the school system for employees and uh, like a thousand units or something like that. So I'm curious as to where it, maybe it doesn't fall under any of this and and you guys can quickly answer that question are we buying and providing for necessary ppe you know masks tests um anything that nurses need elsewhere or yeah. is it within uh within these grants so i got the call over the the holiday and it was for about three and a half million dollars and that was for uh, masks and tests for everybody, every student, every staff. And I uh, said, we will have the money either in this grant or in the general fund through the BAT. If you can find these materials, get them. And I got the impression that Mr. Olszewski had a source and we were going to be able to take that we went through his procurement system and it may be something that involved the state of Maryland and I didn't hear his announcement. So um, we will either and I don't necessarily know that they are going to charge us for that, but regardless, we will we will have the money either in this grant or in the general fund uh, to pay for that and 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 more as 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 it's needed. I think uh, sourcing this stuff is going to be the hard part. Fair enough. Um, Ms. Causey, you had a question? Um, if you could be very concise because we have five minutes left and I don't want to go over time. Yes, I appreciate all of this conversation and with the um, Mr. Saris pointing out that we are going to be receiving the superintendent's recommendation for the operating budget. Um, how is the information that we've been discussing today going to be uh, tied in with the operating budget and uh, presented in the budget book that we typically receive? Thank you. Um, well, you're going to see a list of requests, um, some of which mirror what you're seeing here, except that they'll be general fund proposals and uh, of course will hinge on state and county revenues to the extent they're available. 
Um, but uh, generally, we're we're not duplicating any of these services, but we're expanding these into the general fund over a, a multi year period to anticipate the loss of these funds over time. Thank you, Ms. Mack, you had a question. Yes, um, Mr. Saris, in the FY22 adopted budget, we funded 162 paraeducators. In the December 17th vacancy summary, we show 32.5 vacancies. Is the 131.5 that you're showing here under in, in, extended instructional day, the net of that? And if so, if we've already funded them in the budget, what is the 3.8 million shown for FY 2022? So we have about 1,200 paraeducators in the system. And um, that includes, uh, it does not include this 131. So um, it's, it's difficult to identify in the budget document because most of those paraeducators are special ed and they're funded through grants, either the Title I grant or the IDEA grant. Um, and so if you look in the general fund budget, you're not going to see 1,200 paraeducators. So, no, I see 162. Right. right. And those are primarily, those are regular education pair educators. That's what these 131 are as well. So of the general fund, regular ed folks, we've almost doubled that through the grant. That hundred. So these are, these are in addition to what's in the budget yeah. books. Yes. That's what I needed to know. Thank you. Yeah. So we've doubled that, but in reality, we have well over a thousand. Mr. Okay. McMillian, do you have any questions before we end? No, thank you. I'm sorry, Ms. Mack, did I cut you off? Did you no, I'm good. I, I just needed to understand okay. what the difference was. All right, this has been very helpful. Uh, thank you for sharing this information. Um, I would like to see those um, grant requests and amendments that you were sharing earlier right. attached to board docs so that we can review them ourselves sure. um, and and you know and I'll probably answer a ton of questions that might be lingering out there but we only had an hour and a half and I really don't want to go over time um, so I just want to thank everybody meeting next month date if you want to change that because of the conflict yes We'll, we'll make that decision uh, as we move forward because okay. um, I'm not quite sure what other options we have time wise and I'm open to moving it just just so that you're aware um, Mr. Tantliff is talking about how on our next meeting is scheduled for February 16th. Yes. And the same day and the same time there's a meeting regarding I believe the plans for an expansion school in the Northeast. Yeah, the boundary um, study for Northeast starts at 630. So it'll just okay. be if the members here feel that's a conflict. If if it would work out, we could start this uh, slightly earlier. I don't know what everyone's schedules look like, but we can we'll work on the timing and the scheduling um, outside of this. OK, um, so Thank that's you very stated. Much. Um, there's no further business. This meeting is adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Thank Take you for care. your time. Thanks, Thank Laura. you. Bye-bye.